time if you want to um, have a question or have a comment or want to say something, feel free. This always works better as like a monologue. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of do questions throughout too, but just feel free to jump in. Um, so a quick overview. Uh, first we'll talk about if you want to collaborate. Um, if you want to customize a plugin, um, how you can collaborate th with the developer. Um, and then how you can, if that doesn't work, if you can, how you can extend it um, without actually touching the code. Um, and then using custom hooks as a way to, um, if you do need to modify uh, the plugin's behavior. And then if you need to do a lot of it, you can override their core hooks. And then um, if you actually really, as a last resort, if you need to actually modify the plugin, how you can add in custom hooks to yourself. Um, so the, the, problem, the reason why I wanted to give this presentation is because a lot of times I'll see developers who, um, like you know, you, you grab a plugin because you have a need for something and it kind of mostly works for what you want, but there's, there's some, something here and there where it's yeah, that last 10%, it just doesn't do exactly what you need. So you, there's not a better solution, so you just need to customize it. Um, but the way people do it a lot of times is that they'll just directly modify the plugin files. And this is, creates a lot of problems for the same reasons that you, you never want to modify WordPress files, like the core files, you never want to modify a plugin either. Um, the big reason is that anytime you upgrade the plugin, all your changes are going to get overwritten. Um, or if you just never upgrade the plugin, then you lose, miss out on security updates and bug fixes and any new features that the plugin has. So. Um, there are ways to, you know, if you use version control, you can create a patch against the version and then refresh it every time a new version comes out. But really, it just ends up being much more trouble than it's worth. And so people just usually just don't upgrade at all. Um, but there are a lot of ways that you can work around this to, to do it better. Um, and the first is just to talk to the developer. Um, a lot of times, if you offer to work with them to create whatever the feature is or make it more flexible, um, they'll be glad for the help. Um, and then that way, it's kind of a win-win for everybody because the, everybody else in the community gets to benefit from the code it, that gets back into the plugin. Um, it doesn't always work, though, because a lot of times developers don't have time to review the code or they just, it doesn't match up with what their vision for the plugin is. Or you know, they maybe, maybe it's just a feature that only 20% like of the users are going to actually want, and so they want to keep the core kind of lean. Um, so that's not always going to work. But this, you should try that first before you write any code. Um, and then if sometimes the, the functionality that you need to add, um, you don't actually have to modify the plugin itself. Like um, you don't need to take something that the plugin is doing and change the way it does it, or you don't need to stop it from doing something. All you really want to do is just add on to what it's already doing. Um, so. The way you, you know, to do that, you don't even need to touch the plugin itself. You can just create a second plugin that runs at the same time that the other one does. Um, so this is the example of that. Um, there's a plugin in the repository called Google Authenticator, and it adds two-factor authentication to a site. Um, so uh, it's a security thing. Um, but uh, a lot of times, users don't. You know, you ha each user has to set it up individually because you know you install an app on your smartphone and you get a, a key that uh, matches up with the server. Um, so if, you, if an administrator installs this on a site with you know, 100 users, you know, very few of them are actually going to activate it because for the first thing, they don't even know that it's there. Unless they visit the profile and they see the extra settings, um, they're not going to know it's there. And then if they do know it's there, you know, they're not going to be familiar with two-factor authentication. They're not going to know why they should do it or how they should do it. Um, so it just doesn't really, it, it's great if you know what it is and you know how to use it, but for most people, um, there's, it's kind of missing that fe feature. So I created a second plugin that will um, put an admin notice on their profile if they haven't activated it, telling them that, you know, hey, this is available, um, you know, here's, here's what it is, here's how you do it. And then you can also, the administrator can say, like, if they haven't activated it, then uh, force them to activate it. Don't let them do anything until they've activated it. So, but this doesn't actually change anything that the plugin itself does. It's just adding on to it. So, um, 
this is kind of the core of what it does. Um, it hooks into the init, function, init, init hook um, and then checks if they have it enabled. And uh, if they don't, it adds the admin notice. And if it's in the force mode, it, um, it adds the, it, it, strip, it puts them back to a user, like a subscriber capability and uh, redirects them to the profile. Um, so it's really simple, you know, it's just a separate plugin. It doesn't actually touch the Google Authenticator plugin. Um, so upgrades aren't broken or anything like that. Um, but there are a lot of times where you want to do more than just add something on. You want to take something out, you want to kind of change the way it works. Um, and so just like uh, WordPress itself has hooks to let plugins and themes interact with it or extend it or kind of modify it, uh, plugins and themes themselves can implement their own custom hooks to let other plugins um, interact with it. Um, so some examples of this we'll go through. Um, there's a plugin on uh, wordcamp.org called Taggregator, and um, it basically creates like a social media stream, uh, like pulls in posts from Flickr and uh, Twitter and Instagram um, about like a certain hashtag. Um, and so by default, uh, it has Twitter, Instagram, and Flickr. Um, but there's a filter around, uh, when, when the plugin gets loaded, it, it loads in all these different classes for each kind of external service. But it has a filter around it called uh, the media services um, that lets any other plugin uh, hook into that. And so you know, it'll pass it that array of, of sources with Twitter and Instagram and Flickr, and then uh, the other plugin could add a new source to it, like if you wanted to write one for Vine or, or any other service, or if you wanted to remove some of the services for some reason, you could do that. Um, so like the snippet there, um, it, you know, just like any other filter, it gets a, a variable um, passed in, and then it can modify it and return it. And so now if you have these running you know, in combination, uh, the Vine media source will also be loaded along with Twitter and, and Flickr and Instagram. Or another example is a plugin I wrote called Basic Google Maps Placemarks, where uh, it just embeds a Google map on the site with um, a custom post type for all the different markers. Um, and then you can set the featured image to uh, determine what icon the marker will have on the map. Um, and that works great if you, know, you just have a few, but if you have like hundreds, if you're you know, doing something for an entire state, mapping out all the different fire stations, like this example, um, you, you don't really want to go through and set the, manually set each icon if, you know, there's like four different icons based on like the type of station it is. Um, so you really want to do that programmatically. Um, so there's a filter around uh, the icon variable, like this is the function that gets all the, the different uh, custom posts, and there's a filter around it that um, does the same thing. It just passes that to, um, like any, any uh, plugin can register a callback and get that value passed in and then do anything it wants with it. So like this example, um, it looks it up because uh, you can also pass in extra parameters like the URL, icon URL, that's the value that's being filtered. Um, but you can also pass additional ver uh, variables to the callback. So like the placemark ID, the, the, the ID of the post. So this snippet uh, looks up what categories are assigned to that post. And then it's, it loops through them and determines based on which category is assigned, which icon to use. And then it just returns the URL of the icon. So instead of having to um, you know, manually go through the post, the administrator can just set up a little snippet like this and, um, and just have it all done automatically. And you know, this is just you know, something running in a functionality plugin that never touches the actual, the base plugin. Um, another example uh, is CampTix. It's the plugin we use on WordCamp.org for ticket registration. So like what you use to buy the, the tickets for WordCamp Dayton. Um, and this is, does something, um, and then the, we also have another plugin called CampTix, CampTix Network Tools that has a bunch of extra functionality for multi-site installs like WordCamp.org. So CampTix even is something a little more interesting in that um, it not only uses 
hooks, like actions and filters um, to let external, like other plugins interact with it, but it also uses them internally. So um, like the logging function, for instance, um, during the upgrade routine, if we're already running an upgrade, um, you know, instead of doing the upgrade, you know, a second time and, and creating all kinds of race conditions and overriding values and stuff, we just, you know, we skip the, that, but then we log it just because, you know, we want to know in case we're troubleshooting or something, we want to know that that happened. Um, so when we call the log function, we just pass it an error message, but what the log function does is all it does is call an action um, and pass it all the same data that it was passed. You know, normally, the way you would think about it is that that the log function should be, you know, writing it to the database or, or whatever it's going to do. Um, but here, all it does is call that action. And then it has another function um, inside Camtix that hooks into that, uh, that action, and that's what uh, writes it to the database. Um, in this case, it's writing it to uh, post meta on the attendee record. Um, but then for Camtix network tools, um, not everything is related to a post. There are, there are a lot of other things that go on. And, um, and we also, um, there, there are a couple other reasons why, but uh, we, we want to um, also log it to the database, like a custom database table, um, which normally you don't want to do, but this is uh, one of the few instances where it's actually a good idea. Um, so what the, the second plugin does is it also hooks into that filter, or the action, I mean, and, um, and writes it to the database. But, and if it wanted to, it could unhook the, the function that was adding it to the meta, uh, the custom meta fields also. Um, but in this case, it doesn't. But because it's, because the whole, basically, um, ah, that's the wrong, um, because all the, the function is doing, the log function, all it does in, is calling an action, it's basically, you're making the whole log functionality pluggable. So a plugin can take it out and replace it with anything it wants, or just modify it slightly, or, or do whatever. So it makes it really nice and clean uh, and flexible. Uh, the downside to using custom hooks is that they don't always is exist. The, the developer has to intentionally put them in there. Um, and it's, it's a best practice to do it, but um, you know, it, a lot of developers still don't do it because they don't know or they don't, you know, for whatever reason. Um, so you won't always be able to rely on this, but this is kind of the best way to do it if you can. Um, although there are, um, and, and sometimes they may not have the right hooks. Maybe they'll have, have them in some places but not others, or they just didn't think of a use case for something, so it's not there. Um, so sometimes you'll also need to go a little bit further and um, override their core callbacks. Uh, the callbacks that they registered with core hooks in order to get their plugin to run. Um, so another Google Authenticator example is an add-on called per user prompt. Um, and basically, the way that Google Authenticator works is that it adds the, the token field onto the same form as the username and password field. Um, and the, the bad part about that is that, um, you know, the Google Authenticator is it's tied to a specific user profile. So if the user doesn't have it enabled, you don't really want to show them the prompt. Um, but if by putting it on the, the same screen, that's get, that gets displayed to all users regardless. So it kind of confuses people. Um, they don't know what they're supposed to enter there. They don't know, I mean, they've got like a title attribute on that field that says if you don't have it enabled, then just leave this blank, but nobody is gonna see that unless they're, you know. Um, so it, it just creates a lot of kind of hassles for administrators, you know, and, and confusion for users. So it's not a very good UX. Um, so th what the plugin add-on does is it strips it out of that first screen so that it's back to a normal WordPress default login screen and then it adds a separate step into the login workflow that if they have it off, if, if they have it enabled, then it will prompt for it and handle it. Um, and so to do this, um, I had to actually kind of take out the, the callbacks that the Google Authenticator plugin registered and then kind of add back in my own modified version of them. 
so this is Google Authenticator's init function, and it's loading uh, callbacks for the login form to put that extra field on there, and uh, the login footer to um, output some extra HTML, and the authenticate hook, which is what runs when you enter your username and password to you know, validate whether it's you know, good or not. Um, so the, what the other plugin does is it removes those actions and filters um, and then adds in uh, just kind of modified versions of them um, to, to add in that extra step in the workflow to you know, check if they've got it enabled, then display this form before you let them log in. Um, and so this is just the function that um, prompts for that token. Um, and, uh, and the one that checks it. Um, but then one, one good thing to do is try to, you wanna reuse as much as their plugin as you can. So if, like it, here, this is the form that wraps that, that second step that gets injected into the workflow where um, you enter the token. Um, so I've got like all the HTML for um, just kind of the, the redirect URL, like building the, the form itself, but then for the fields that Google Authenticator adds, the, the one for the token, and the few other things that are wrapped around that, I'm not actually regenerating those in the second plugin, I'm just calling the function from Google Authenticator that does it. So if he makes any changes to it um, in the plugin itself, I don't have to make any changes here, it just gets pulled in automatically. Um, and that keeps it more kind of, um, more clean, more, um, so the, the problem with this um, method is that it does require a lot more work. Um, you have to really understand what the plugin is doing and how it works, um, and, and you also have to monitor it. Like any, um, any new commits to it that get added um, could potentially break your changes because you're plugin is so tightly coupled to, to the base. Um, so like WordPress.org lets you subscribe to commits for any plugin in the repository. Um, like for instance, there was an update to Google Authenticator about a month ago where he upgraded the, um, the hash algorithm for the secret that gets stored in the database because the, um, the one he was using has rainbow tables for it. So that'll break, um, like if I didn't update my plugin in his, new release rolled out, anyone who was using my plugin, they wouldn't be able to log in because it would, it would break. Um, the, the two values wouldn't match up. So I got the email that his had changed and then um, I just updated mine so that it would work. Um, it kind of detects like whether, sh what, if it should use the current algorithm or if it u should use the new one. And then I released that um, before he released the, the update for his. So anyone who um, was still was using my plugin, could use it. Uh, it'd be compatible with the current version, and it'll be compatible when they upgrade. Um, but it is it is more work, so you have to do that. Um, and also, if depending on how their plugin is written, um, you know, it may just not be modular enough. If it's all kind of kind of spaghetti code, it, it's sometimes a lot. It just doesn't. You can't reuse bits and pieces. You can't unhook certain things without also unhooking other things. Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't work in all circumstances. Um, but as a last resort, if you really need to, you can um, just modify the plugin directly. But in this case, instead of putting uh, all your changes into the plugin, um, it's better to just add in those custom uh, hooks that you would need as if the developer had put them in there originally. Um, and then you can submit a patch to the developer to have him add that uh, officially to the plugin. Um, and if he does, then you, know, you don't have to worry. You can just keep using it, and when the new release comes out, um, you can override the custom hooks that you've added in there because it's just gonna be the same. Um, and if it doesn't, it's still a lot easier to just create a patch with those custom hooks and refresh it each time uh, a release comes out than it would be to uh, refresh it with all of your changes. Um, so an example of this, um, I had a client a couple years ago who was using the advanced custom fields plugin like extensively and um, 
what that does is basically creates a bunch of kind of custom post types and, and custom meta fields uh, through a user interface. Um, and so they had all this content that was built using that, uh, but it was also a multilingual site. So they were using the WPML plugin to uh, translate um, each, uh, all of that content. So the way that that works is that it basically creates kind of a, a, a second post for each language. Um, and because at the time, Advanced Custom Fields wasn't using WordPress's um, uh, custom post API for the metadata, it had its own database tables. And so WPML wasn't aware of the Advanced Custom Fields data. Uh, it, it didn't have any way of knowing what it was, it couldn't talk to it. So you, when you translated a post, you couldn't translate any of the, uh, the meta fields. So I kind of had to write a plugin to sit in the middle between the two and, and kind of let them talk to each other. Um, but WPML didn't have the, the custom hooks that I needed to, to hook into that process and, and fire certain things when um, certain events happened. So instead of uh, you know, putting all my code into the plugin, into WPML, all I did was just, you know, put in my the action that I wanted in the place that I wanted it, and then I sent a patch to developer, and they added that into the uh, the official plugin. Um, and then this is just the the thing, the callback for that that custom hook. Um, so the kind of important things I think um, to take away are just. You almost never need to to modify a plugin directly. Um, there's there's always a way to almost always a way to to write a second plugin that runs alongside it, um, and then that way you don't lose your changes. You're still able to to upgrade easily, um, and try to collaborate with the the original developer because that that works a lot better for everybody. Um, you get the changes that you need, but then the community also benefits from it. Um, but if you have to, you can, you can write a separate plugin that runs alongside the base plugin. Um, and then when you're writing your own plugins, it's also really good to add those custom hooks into it, because that way it makes it easier for other developers to, um, to make your plugin, to extend it, to customize it, to fit their needs. Um, so if you want, uh, I've got some links to um, some articles that go into more depth than this, and just links to all the examples that I've used. Um, but that's it. Um, does anyone have any questions or want to add anything? So I'm assuming if you uh, create, uh, you're saying that you create a custom hook within someone else's and then you create a patch for that. So if they don't adopt that patch, uh -huh. then every, whenever they get a new version, then you would have to add your patch to that version of the of the API. Right. Yeah. It's still. Um, it's still going to be easier to do that than if you have to add in all your changes, though. Um, so it's just you're minimizing um, instead of you know hundreds of lines. It's just going to be that one line for that one filter. Yeah, um, it would depend on specifically what you want to do, um, but I mean you can always detect if another plugin is um, is activated on the site and then do something based on that. Or um, you could technically bundle the other plugin with yours, but that doesn't. That's what um, I was wondering. Yeah, you run into that more with themes than than plugins, but um, it's it's not really considered a good idea to do it. Um, a lot of times people do it just because there's not a really convenient standard for saying that there's a dependency. Um, if you Google like WordPress plugin dependencies or WordPress theme dependencies, there are some, um, like there's a plugin in the repo that kind of tries to create a standard based around that. Um, you make a dependency like to say, hey, this is not going to work without this plugin. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I typically do, um, and then it's just kind of on the, the user to to, to go and plugin. download it. But right. yeah, okay. I basically say you know, um, WordPress has a, a function called um, 
plugin activated or something like that, um, and you pass it the, the base name of the file, and if it's not, then I just say, instead of loading the plugin, I just display an admin notice saying, you know, this plugin requires plugins X, Y, Z, please install them. Yeah, and you mentioned um, like interacting with other plugins. A lot of times people will use, like if you have a, a free plugin and then some premium add-ons to it, a lot of times people will use custom hooks as a way to uh, have those two integrate together. Any questions about just plugin development in general or anything you want to talk about with the whole group or anything? Yeah. Um, cool. Well, thanks for coming.